stars getting so like hard that I'm out of stars Bringing out my heart's but I'm stopped painting All set this battle that you're a strange one Talk a lot of bullshit and make your fucking brain Capcom's Demon World Village, aka Makai Mora franchise. Here, it's also known as Ghosts and Goblins or Ghouls and Ghosts. First originating in the arcades back in 85, this series, with the exception of Gargoyles Quest, which I'll dive into later, has become synonymous with the words arcade ball busting hard. First to round off the lineup, Ghosts and Goblins for the NES, released in 1986, a direct port of the original arcade classic, reprogrammed on behalf of Capcom by the infamous Micronics. Now before I proceed with the review, I'd like to pass along my regards and gratitude to Liz and Aya, aka Satsuki from Sidestep Complex, and Alex Miller, both from the short-lived Far From Normal, Brian Fitzgerald from Troll 2, NOT THAT TROLL 2 FOR GOD'S SAKE, Brittany McLean from Replay in Brighton, Ray Vasquez the Lava Buster from Connecticut, Mike Testa from Stoneham, Sam Pike from Middleborough, Amanda Brack, Andrew Lowry's better half, and surprisingly enough, an avid Zelda fan, Dan Hammer, Snessy and Walkin' Circles, that Chappelle and Pillbeam respectively, DJ Clickbait, and finally the Geekbeat Radio and Boston Open Screen communities, specifically Carballo, Solomon, Ogun Madero, Healy Van Voorhees, Atwood Arabian, Campbell, Kamalinsky, Trembley, and others. With that out of our system, onto the overall storyline, and by now, I'll bet everyone's familiar with it, right? It starts off with our main protagonist, Sir Arthur, in shit all but a pair of red undies, alongside Princess Prinprin, aka Guinevere. And just when they're about to quote-unquote go heels to Jesus, from out of nowhere appears Satan who wastes absolutely no time abducting the ever-loving bejesus out of the ladder. Hence, old Artie suits up to once and for all vanquish the forces of darkness, cause as we all know, he won't be having any of that shit! You think you know ball-bustingly hard, direct from arcade platformers? Wake the fuck up! As the title implies, you're taking control of Arthur as he plows his way through endless hordes of ghosts and goblins, and other horror-related adversaries, in order to eventually reach the inevitable hell that is the Devil's Tower, and fulfill your ultimate goal. In terms of controls, your D-pad moves around our main head honcho of a knight, both on ground, and even getting him to climb and descend ladders, the latter of where he's unable to strike back, thus leaving you in the deepest shits imaginable, if your agility's not on point. And the traditional B and A to attack and jump respectively standard applies here. Weaponry-wise, Arthur starts off with a rather standard, but eventually counterproductive javelin, which he can fire off without any chance of splurging, and can later swap it with a knife, a torch, an axe, and a cross shield, all of which work contrasting sets of leverages and detriments, depending on which weapon you experiment with. Before I forget, the latter is mandatory as shit if you intend to reach the ass end of the quest. 
get it twice by any adversary, or expose yourself to any peril, your ass is either a pile of sticks and bones, or an inanimate casualty, thus resulting in the traditional instant life loss. Likewise, if you run out of time... On the bright side, though, not only is your current weapon kept intact, no matter which one you've got, let alone is Arthur still capable of battling partly nude after taking a hit, in which case armor replacements are available, considering how scarce they are. A convenient checkpoint system takes effect depending on your headway, with the exception of the last two stages. Again, more on that later. Complete with a map layout shown in between each life you lose, in or the start of each area after clearing the previous one, and of course, every continuation attempt. And as we're all aware of by now, there are six stages in total, not counting the final boss confrontation. And not only are each of them beyond brutal, they will tempt you to douse your console in gasoline and oil, torch the son of a bitch, and piss uncontrollably out its ashes like it's no one's Christ-forsaken beeswax! Getting back to the endless assortment of threats that Arthur confronts throughout his fatiguing fray, from the graveyard, through abandoned, desolate ghost towns, and barren, perilous underground caves, all the way to the Devil's Tower, there's these stereotypical zombies and forest ghosts that appear randomly, and at the most inopportune moments, I should add. Not to mention ravens, Venus flytraps, what do you know, another unsuspecting long-last relative of Audrey too. Who's he or she supposed to be? Audrey over 9000? Blue imps and white mini-demons that pop out of the shadows, flying knights, and don't even fucking get me started with those volatile-ass red devils, who, for the record, stars in his own spin-off series of games aside from future sequels, which will yet again be discussed later. Not convinced? Even the ogres, which take an ungodly, unprecedented fuckton of hits to incapacitate, bats, tower monsters, dark magicians, or warlocks if you prefer, that'll temporarily cast the infamous frog spell on Arthur, and fuck no this has jack shit to do with Julian Sands, and those randomly awakening skeletons will all but ensure your quest goes to absolute cockall. And since we're on the subject of enemy confrontations, there's a paper-thin line between trial and error and luck-based advancements, and regardless of your skill level, the majority of said confrontations pretty much fall within the latter. Same spiel with the hazard evasion endurances, most notably in Stage 2 and onward. Which in turn brings us to the bosses. You've got the Unicorn, a one-horned Cycloptic Ogre, whom you have to face three of in a row, and another at the end. One in the first stage, and two in the next stage thereafter. A multi-segmented Blue Dragon, and of course Thane himself, followed immediately by the Great Demon King Astaroth, aka the Devil, whom we'll see in later installments. All of which, if you're not prepared, and I shit you the hell not, will do a hell of a lot more than make you cry foul, and drive your ass to drink 200 billion liters of Jägermeister, blended with fucking absinthe and formaldehyde. Upon defeating your current stage fuckhead of a boss, it's on to the next area, and watch rinse repeat in tandem with more volatile perils that await your ass. Thought I'd continue on without discussing the overall quality control and gameplay formula? Guess again. They're about as cemented as a goddamn fence post, precisely regarding the jumping trajectory in which Arthur can manage his aerial capabilities, those aforementioned hazard and adversary evasion approaches, and even his unstable restraint from self-defense on ladders. Looking at you, Goonies, too. And most importantly, would have definitely used a smidgen or two of fine-tuned and augmentation. I mean, what the fuck, Capcom? But all in all, the latter, the gameplay formula, that is, isn't too much of an impediment to enlighten oneself with. Oh no. In terms of Ghosts and Goblins Challenge, speaking of which, that's our keyword for this and every other segmental diatribe in this series. Therefore, feel free to refer back to both the damage and time limit stipulations, as well as the enemy and boss confrontation parameters, since they tie in with this prevailing department, and also, fuck redundancy and self-repetition. Diving right back into the weaponry lineup, the knife is the most useful for any situation, and just flat-out trumps the javelin, aka Lance, in every conceivable way. As for the torch and the axe, now I see why many tend to look the other way, considering they're both as useless as the racist gender-bender head trap and dynamite heady, and the map and defenders of Dinatron City possibly combined, despite the former dealing a hell of a lot more damage than the latter. And remember when I said how mandatory the cross shield was in order to reach the last area? Without it, the game tells you to outright piss off and boot your ass back to the start of Stage 5 and acquire that shit. Though in the same token, even if said weapon was in your possession, upon facing the Unicorn for the last time, you'll realize right away that it does fuck all to that asswipe. And the same applies to the final confrontation with the Blue Dragon, in which virtually identical case, the Javelin AK Lance does doggy dick to his ass. Bottom line, you're better off using their polar opposite weaknesses. And what's even more of a huge shit-filled gyozo platter with turtle semen for dipping sauce, upon confronting and vanquishing the hell out of Astaroth, again, excuse the pun, not only does the game inform us about Satan's illusion trap he's devised, excuse me, deficit, in fact, let me just correct that shit for you right there. Foi fucking law. That very same message cons us into dominating the entire game TWICE in order to unlock the real conclusion. Huh, <laughs> best of luck if you're up to said endeavor. And while we're at it, gang back to the time limit, notice right away that when you reach a checkpoint, it resets at that very moment. Any moment I'm expecting Jareth from Labyrinth to pop up, rest in peace, Bowie, to alter the time in some form, namely making it run out faster. Extra
your hints aside, you only get two lives, more of which you can acquire upon scoring more points, or racking up Arthur icons, not to mention differentiating Yashichi icons, cause it's fucking Capcom, obviously, which also grants Arthur extra time, or deduct it, depending on the color, and an infinite continue benefit available to the title screen upon losing your last life. My key point, in addition to possessing the reflexes of even Kenshiro from Fist of the North Star, and carrying out special delivery after a fucking special delivery of non-stop ass-curb stomping, be aware of each situation you'll risk out there, or your ass won't last as long as, say, half the duration of an episode of Fear the Walking Dead. For an early NES game, as much as I detest bashing on the simplistic graphics, they're about as dull as a partly dim light bulb, albeit decent. Notwithstanding its efforts to emulate the macabre, dreary atmosphere of its original arcade counterpart, each and every background leaves a myriad to be desired. The opposing and supporting characters alike are too simplistic in spite of the console's limitations, and the less I say about the inclement half-assed frame rates in tandem with the goddamn torment-infused clusterfuckathon of sprite flickering, no less, the better. This is especially evident in 1942, which Capcom put out around the same time. Speaking of which, as mentioned earlier, and in my Atomic Robokid review, my Season 1 finale from back in the fall of 14, to be precise, both 42 and Ghost and Goblins were reprogrammed by the same folks responsible for both SNK Playmore's Athena and Akari Warriors 1 and 2, not to mention Activision Super Pitfall and Ghostbusters, Toys Matomo Abunai Deka, and even the SNES version of Ride and Trad, amongst many other ignominious atrocities, namely Micronix. Christ, even Tosei in now production, whether or not they're still in existence, could've arranged way better development tasks than what we're dealing with, and at least Gradius, Twin V, Trojan, Metroid Zelda, and Kid Icarus, the latter four of which didn't hit the states until the following year, oh, I don't know, aged more elegantly than even this! As far as music and sound is concerned, with the combined efforts of Harumi Fujita, Bionic Commando, Tiger Road, later Final Fight, the NES versions of Strider and Willow, and later spawned by acclaimed Sony and Ukiyote fame, alongside Ayako Mori of the aforementioned 1942, Sun Sun, Pirate Ship Higamaru, Gunsmoke, Sidearms, and Trojan fame, helming the compositions based on their original arcade soundtrack, despite the former revealing that she only handled the sound effects at the time, as intense and energetic as the scores are, be prepared to look the other motherfucking way, cause each and every theme throughout will drone over you in the span of a fortnight, notwithstanding the substantial extent of variety they provide, my personal favorites being Areas 1 and 2, which would later serve as Arthur's intro overture for future installments, and especially Areas 3 and 4, likewise with the participating sound effects, which are far from bland but still repetitious. And lastly, concerning Ghosts and Goblins' replayability, in total consideration of how extremely frustrating this game can become, even to the most seasoned, experienced, and skilled nonetheless, constant focus, memorization, and willpower are but a few of many vital factors to take into steadfast account if you fully intend to conquer this hellish, inexorable, razor-sharp guillotine blade of a game. And speaking of guillotine blades... Exhibit B, Ghouls and Ghosts for the Genesis, released three years later. Oh, this is reprogrammed by Sega based on Capcom's original concept. And just like its predecessor, a direct port of its original arcade counterpart. MC Face Palm, you have the floor. Taking place three years following Arthur's previous gauntlet, we see both him and the love of his life reuniting once more. When suddenly two rays of light rain down, thus wiping out not only the latter but the former protagonist's horse, hence the handiwork of none other than Lucifer, aka Loki, not to be confused with Matt Damon's character in Dogma. Now Arthur is out and about yet again to resurrect his entire civilization by, yep, you guessed it, stopping at Dickall to exterminate the ever-loving fuck out of every heartless, pissant, undead, and demonic being in existence. And before I forget, one thing I like to throw out there, there's no opening intro on like both the original arcade version and the Japan-only super graphics and sharp XXD8000 ports. Like, come the fuck on, Sega. On to the gameplay, all you facepalm. It's basically the same spiel as previous games, but with a slew of drastic changes applied and augmented upon. Arthur can now fire his projectiles upward and downward, preferably while in mid-air, aside from the traditional horizontal offenses. His weaponry range, aside from the standard lance, flames, axe, and knife, now includes two newer ones. A discus that travels on ground and a sword only good for close-range encounters. Oh, and three, including a top-secret, mandatory as fuck magic power, only available during your second run after clearing the first. When getting exposed to that bastard warlock, Arthur changes into either a duck or an old senior citizen version of himself, depending on whether he's in full armor or in his boxes, respectively. And Arthur can acquire a magical golden suit of armor that can summon all kinds of kick-ass incantations, depending on what primary weapon he's got in his possession. Take note that it can be deteriorated instantly upon enduring any damage, just like the standard silver armor. 
In addition to the customary movements and climbing tactics, while A and C are for jumping, B carries out author's desired offenses, and you can toggle the crouching and running swaps in the option area beforehand, hence diagonals okay or no diagonals. The enemy lineup in stage by stage itinerary consists of skeleton murderers, vultures, sickle weasels, puking pigmen, and red poisonous flowers in the execution area. Rock turtles, ant lions, the offspring of ogre mayflies, red devil kings, creatures made of flame, including bats, wolves, and the like, in the village of decay, flying goblins, dayflies, green monsters, tower monsters, and the like, all of which will sweep the floor with your arteries like it's no one's beeswax if your wits aren't sharp as attack. Other areas include Baron Rankle's Tower, the Crystal Forest, and finally Loki's Castle. And in tandem with those earlier recounted opposing adversaries, every hazardous peril you'll encounter will extremely test your reflexes to their absolute fucking limits. Thought we'd forget about their participating end bosses? Consider yourselves gravely mistaken. There's this colossal demon god slash knight bastard child hybrid of a living statue whose noggin is used as both a shield and weapon in terms of the fireballs it spews out concerning the latter. Namely the shielder, Cerberus, not to be confused with the two-headed brown wolf and altered beast, a flame engulfed canine who's also the guardian of the demon realm, the gust aka Mr. Winds, a single floating giant eyeball shrouded in fog that can summon weather-based defenses in the form of hurricanes and lightning. Krakow, meet your new ancestor. Ohm, a gargantuan green slug monster aided by none other than its minuscule maggot and massive worm offspring offense-wise, and its only weakness is the row of pulsating hearts that pop up randomly, and lastly the return of the nefarious Astaroth, in fucking duplicate I might add, followed by an all-new giant fly adversary, Beelzebub, or the Lord of the Flies if you prefer, that can warp upon transforming into smaller variations of itself, at which point Arthur's immune, and again, must be confronted and eradicated near the entrance of Lucifer's castle following your duel with the aforementioned Astaroth and his clones, and by now, you pretty much get the gist of it all. Control-wise, they've been tremendously improved from its predecessor, notwithstanding how jarring and paralyzed from the socket up they can be, likewise with the customary gameplay procedure. Challenge face palm. It's a hell of a lot more inexorable this time around. Be sure to take into account each and every hint I threw at you earlier, as did yours truly, regarding the usual enemy countering and hazard avoidance approaches. And if you're able to think back on that top secret mandatory weapon for the final plethora of incidents, more power to you. It's a psycho cannon, a source of the battle goddess's powers supplied by the archangel Saint Michael, and can only be bestowed upon Arthur if you're wearing the golden armor during your second run, as discussed earlier. The only few setbacks are if you've got another weapon in your possession while half nude, you're left with no other alternative but to replace your goddamn armor, obviously like in the previous outing. And to top it all off, if the cycle cannon's not on you upon once again defeating Beelzebub and reaching Lucifer, aka Loki, consider yourself in deep fucking shit. As always, you're given three lives and infinite continues like the previous game, and the usual stage checkpoint system applies in between each life, especially after getting a game over. Graphics face palm. As per usual, for an early Genesis game released the same year as these titles seen here, they definitely trumped the fuck out of the predecessor by three times the length of even Evanstone and Lexington Steel's schlongs combined. The majority of every stage background has been provided with more depth than ever before. The illumination in the forest of stage one, the deserted and later incinerated next to donkey dick villages in stage two, and others. The primary characters opposing and supporting alike have been given a much deserved facelift. All in all, notwithstanding the frequent yet substantial sprite flickers, remarkable presentation is goddamn remarkable. Music and sound-wise, orchestrated by Tamayo Kawamoto, based on her original arcade soundtrack, also of Sun Sun, Pirate Ship Higemaru, Savage Beast, aka XNXs, Commando, Section Z, Black Tiger, Tiger Road, Forgotten Worlds, and of course, Buster Brothers fame for Capcom. She's also part of Taito's in-house band Suntata, of Galactic Attack and Raystorm fame, amongst many of the latter company's classics. While the first stage anthem is a reprise of that from its predecessor, this time toned down in speed, but still adequate and does more than set the adventurous tone for the remainder of the game, every other anthem heard throughout sports a more cop yet rhapsodic aura, and is every bit gratifying. The sound effects have been greatly improved upon, in spite of their ever so repetitious nature. My top six favorites from this installment alone are as follows. The title anthem is on the arcade starting intro, stages 2, 3, and 4, and boss anthems 2 and 4. Replayability phase palm. Ranking a tad higher than its predecessor, you'll be begging to attempt conquering ghouls and ghosts like your dear natural born life depended on it. 
taking into consideration every factor and hint established throughout regarding the overall difficulty curve and other tidbits, which we can't stress any larger and reminding everyone to refer back. Bottom line, consider yourself a douchebag if you even think about leaving this follow-up out in the cold. Many thanks, Facepalm. Moving on to the final exhibit... Gargoyles Quest, released for the Game Boy the following year. Oh, this is more or less a spin-off of the Ghosts and Goblins franchise. This time you're playing as Firebrand. In terms of plotline for this installment, following a brief yet prolonging struggle between the inhabitants of the Ghoul Realm and a massive ruthless cadre of destroyers led by the nefarious King Bragger, all is in order thanks to the inimitable efforts and staggering power of a legendary mutant gargoyle known as the Red Blaze. However, history has since repeated itself, and it's now in the hands of a self-determined Red Armor, namely the earlier recounted Firebrand, to uptake a aforementioned role and live up to its key objectives. Shifting gears to the rudimentary gameplay formula, much unlike its distant cousins, Gargoyle's Quest is much more than just your typical average RPG slash action platformer hybrid. Looking at you, Zelda 2. Same with Oh What a Shock, another Capcom classic, Bionic Commando, in which you're guiding our head honcho Red Devil from his partly desecrated home area to the ascent of the Ghoul Realm's Dimension Portal. The latter genre applies to Firebrand's efforts in meeting said primary goal as he confronts and eradicates simpler to more volatile adversaries, as well as vital bosses, the latter of which I'll get to momentarily, in order to reach every consecutive destination, procuring special artifacts to not only boost up Firebrand's physical abilities, but to further interact with key characters, including the Barones Jark and Byman, King Darkone himself, and even a messenger known as Majorita, on his crusade to restore his surroundings to their former glory. As for the former, they pretty much run the gamut from ghouls, or what I like to call the KKK wannabe destroyer messengers, skeletal fish, living flames, exploding fungi, dead wing flies, bouncing gloom eyes, rhyme not intended, Venus flytraps that hawk outside gloom eyes, burrowing rock monsters, horned toads, twin mars, or aquatic skeletal mercenaries, oversized ghouls known as gorillars, and malgors, or skeletal gargoyles if you will, to name several. Getting to Firebrand's nuts and bolts control aspect, the D-pad makes them migrate north, south, east, or west in the top few RPG segments, and horizontally in the action platforming segments, B cancels any screen as well as manages the dialogue, so does A, which also accesses a menu with four basic commands, Dragon Warrior much? Talk, use, level, and check, the latter two of which are abbreviated, cause Game Boy limitations, goddammit, all of which allow Firebrand to converse with any on-screen character, whether they're a helpful ally, or ruthless, boner-devouring, pissant, bastard destroyer adversary, the latter of which results in a duel, summon any key magic artifact, access his overall stats in terms of the abilities and artifacts he's amassed, and the items and currency he owns, and finally, acquire any item sought, over and or in front of which Firebrand stands, in the former genre-based perspective, and in the latter, BNA allow Firebrand to spew out his fire projectiles, and jump or fly for limited periods, respectively. Effectively, hence the wings provided gauge on the bottom, next is vitality. Hell, it can even cut off Firebrand's wing flight duration at any time before said gauge depletes all the way, and traverse up walls a la Ninja Gaiden. Move over, Hayabusa. Take note that the latter technique can and will result in a sudden collision with any unsuspecting nearby hazard. Unlike Metroid, or maybe Clash of Demon Head by Victor Kai, Gargoyle's quest is more on the linear side in that you're always informed of your next destination and or objective along the way. Following the defeat of that oversized, undead, boner-devouring rectal wart blowfish, Zundo Juror, aka your first boss, whom you'll be running into at later intervals, shit if rarely, you're then venturing through the remainder of the entire Ghoul Realm, eventually reaching the first of its several towns. Within each town, the overall population of inhabitants, zombies and gargoyles alike, range from at least 8 to 12, and can be either helpful in terms of certain key clues that they offer, or as useless as 5-hour energy, V8, and Jerry Garcia's tap water combined in terms of repetitive one-track dialogue, or vague, empty excuses for insults. There's even both a shop to exchange a certain amount of vials, which for the record are this game's currency, for an item called the Talisman of the Cyclone, aka Firebrand's life insurance. Speaking of which, they can also be rounded up in action platforming scenarios, random as they are, and of course a resurrection temple, in which you're provided a revival incantation in the form of an 8-digit password. Concerning the remainder of every key item and artifact that Firebrand can acquire, or is bestowed upon him, aside from the two common types of vials, the ones used for currency, which can also be acquired within towns and or buildings in the RPG segments, likewise during the action platformer segments, especially after exterminating a random enemy, and the aptly named Essence of the Soul Stream, used for instant life refills, like the energy tanks in Mega Man 2 and onward, or instant resurrection upon death, in tandem with the central bosses he encounters later within each area. Upon meeting and hitting it off with Barone Jark in Town 1, in terms of vowing to recover his gremlin stick, first bestowed by Dark Cohen, he bestows upon you the fingernail of the Spectre, which allows Firebrand to perform a longer jump, in addition to extending the limit of his wing's flight duration. 
Jark's Gremlin Stick itself, acquired after wiping out the Four Eyes, an arrangement of Ghoulish Eyes lodged in four differentiating adjacent corners. Not only does Firebrand grant the first of three all-new Fireball Attack enhancements, it informs Jark of his predictions of Darkone's Crisis, hence his bestowal of the Candle of the Poltergeist on you, before reaching the underground passage to the next town, following that first perilous Fire Bridge. A random pussy-ass zombie then lends you the Armor of the Dragon, after accepting his test of wits. Another Wingflight extension slash enhancement, the Wings of the Falcon, found under a nearby Deadwood tree not too far from your next destination, namely the partly ravaged palace of the Ghoul Realm's one sovereign ruler, King Darkoan. After not only evading countless hardships and dangers, for example, boulders and fire traps set off by loose floor fragments, breakable walls, and a strong gust of wind accompanied by a storm to specify a few, but also engaging in yet another duel with Belzamos, based on Beelzebub, except here we've got a bastard child clone of Old Bub and Death. Both are determined Red Armor and the rightful ruling King finally meet, and after resurrecting the latter by the aforementioned Candle of the Poltergeist, Darkoan, in addition to boosting up Firebrand's abilities with his own remaining fucking power, informs him of the inevitable Red Blaze, which, upon meeting up with more undead and supernatural individuals alike, will offer you more pertinent intel, including the second and final Baron, Byman, who turns out to be nothing more than a total dick, regardless of your intentions, but experiences a change of heart after you accost Zakadruzer, aka a royal version of Ghost Rider's long lost dyslexic metrosexual LSD addict step cousin in the Desert of Destitution, and recover the Candle of Darkness, thus granting you another, or the second, if you will, of the three Fireball Attack enhancements. In addition to testing your ultimate abilities against the miniature gargoyle and procuring the final enhancements of Firebrand's overall lifespan, the Armor of Guile, which shit knows this is dick all to do with Street Fighter 2, period. Upon entering and traversing through the secret passage from Byman's Sacred Throne out back, another chance meeting ensues, this time with a cloaked figure known as Majorita, who in his true and more darker form, after lighting the earlier recounted Candle of Darkness, enlightens you about the legend in question as it unfolds, complete with two random, ruthless adversary altercations, both of which take place before and after, respectively. Dauntlessly perambulating through one of several deserted Naga paths in order to reach the true Red Blaze, who turns out to be none other than, what do you know, another goddamn shock. The final boss from Ghouls and Ghosts, namely Lucifer, aka Loki, here is renamed Brushafell, and of course the sole owner of the last augmentation of an artifact to Firebrand's offensive and physical prowess, namely the Eternal Candle. And well, that's pretty much, if almost, the itinerary in a nutshell. Before I forget, upon losing your last life, two of which you only start with from the get-go, you end up starting back at the beginning of the previous dungeon, if possibly not there, via the nearest possible resurrection temple, with all the vials kept intact that you've racked up so far, except the quantity of your cyclone talisman is reset to one each time. While the controls in the top view RPG enactments are standard and manageable, minus the routine time-honored experience grinding, of course, those in the side-scrolling action platforming areas can take a serious, full-on deal of observation, precision, and judgment to get the hang of, notwithstanding its straightforward, self-explanatory concept. And the gameplay formula is far from a mundane as fuck chore, no ifs, ands, buts, or maybe's there. Concerning GQ's challenge, unlike everything I've covered so far, you might think that you know the ropes around every action platformer, especially at the very beginning, I might add. Looking at you again, Mega Man, but don't let the first few areas fool you. Doing parts of the two-hit health meter, which once again can be enhanced in later intervals, as well as the minimal, circumscribed jumping and flying capabilities. Expect your ass to get handed back faster than Rufio from Hook, portrayed by Dante Bosco, of course, if your dexterity isn't up to speed. Shit, even with your physical wing duration, health, and attack enhancements, as much of a spring picnic as one might think it would be, this game pulls absolutely no punches whatsoever. In in fact, paraphrasing Full Metal Jacket, rest in peace Stanley Kubrick. It'll gouge out your eyeballs, unscrew your head, skull fuck you and finally shit, you can jizz down your neck simultaneously. Take the second boss fight with the four isolated eyes on the walls atop the Gremlin Tower, for instance. Not only do you have to utilize the pillar platform at the top while dealing with the first half, but also a lone platform between two spike beds while dealing with the other. Each Flame Loogie attack that you talk out must absolutely count, as the range is rather limited, or it'll miss your target completely, unless it's on screen, of course. Getting back to the random adversary showdowns in the action platforming scenarios, as mandatory and cakewalkish as they are, they pretty much overstay the fuck out of even their own goddamn welcome. Now, about the three new types of magic firebreath skills that Firebrand amasses, the Blockbuster, Claw, and the Dark Fire, the former of which is summoned from the Gremlin Stick, great for clearing out walls, if nothing else, and is quite strong against Rushafell. As for the Median and Penultimate, summoned from the Candle of Darkness, it definitely trumps the Blockbuster, and is feasible for making platforms on spiked walls. And take note, their presence is temporary, so I traverse swiftly in between if I were you. And the latter, namely the Dark Fire, the final and most potent enhancement, summoned from the Eternal Candle. All I can say about it, aside from trumping the previous two, is that it's mandatory for laying the smackdown on King Breaker. Without a Consider your chances of trying for way less than a shit. On well, speaking of, in true Streets of Rage fashion, considering that game wasn't out till a year later, prior to duking it out with the King of Destruction himself, you'll offer your choice whether or not he'll bestow the entire realm upon you. Now take my advice, pick no, otherwise he'll diminish all your health, wing duration, and fire breath level ups you've gained so far to complete fuck all, within the blink of a goddamn I know less. Other than what I've laid down, bear in mind the 8 digit resurrection incantation disguise password system hint I established earlier.
for yet another early, albeit overlooked, Game Boy game. I'm looking at you, Korth. The graphics are exquisite and painstaking for both the action platforming backgrounds and simplistic yet tasteful top view maps. Seriously, it's like Capcom really got their shit together. The sprites, despite the occasional flickering and a few visual setbacks, are meticulously designed and live to a rather exceptional degree, namely not only Firebrand himself, but also his feared rivals, small and big alike. The various Ghoul Realm inhabitants, in terms of his zombie and gargoyle peers, regardless of the type of gameplay scenario that's taking place. Likewise with the side view hazards, for example the aforementioned fire traps, giant cannonballs, the whole nine Korax. Hell, they even trump those of Fall the Foot Clan, Korth and Nemesis by leaps and bounds, if probably not by much, no pun intended. But I digress. Though there are a few, if countless, glaring typos slash punctuation errors lost in the straightforward translated dialogue that might throw off even the most curious gamers far and wide. And must I mention Firebrand's infamous miscoloring on the cover slash cartridge art as opposed to every other appearance, even in future sequels, I might add? All in all, brilliant visuals are fucking brilliant. Music and sound-wise, composed once again by Harumi Fujita, this time with Yoko Shimomura, despite both being uncredited. The latter of Final Fight, Codename Viper, Adventures in the Magic Kingdom, Little Nemo for the Arcade, Street Fighter II The World Warrior, The King of Dragons, Varth Operation Thunderstorm, Breath of Fire, The Punisher, and even Super Mario RPG Legend of the Seven Stars, to ball number one alongside various other composers, Parasite Eve, and Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2, the latter four titles for Square Enix, following her departure from Capcom. Each and every piece heard throughout is nothing short of phenomenal, and just screams goth all over, with that iconic, exhilarating horror themed Ghost and Goblins feel, for which the series is truly honored as well as recognized. The sound effects, on the other hand, as appropriate and tolerable as they are, they just flat out scream meh and clash massively with the soundtrack, specifically the text scrolling and boss damage tones, which can get pretty fucking vexatious and grating. Talk about a suffering to the calm, pulsating mind mixed with a recipe for eternal ear rape! Meaning rants aside, my top 8 songs from this game alone are as follows. The villages and building interiors, the overworld, the firebridge and the sand maze paths of Naga, Darkoan's Palace, Boss Anthems 1 and 2, and finally Rushafell, aka Lucifer's Loose Keep and the ending hymn. Concerning Gargoyle's quest replayability, need I go any further regarding this game's lasting value? While there's almost hardly any at all, the tendency to leave a few zones unturned along the way is existent, in tandem with the earlier recounted, undemanding, albeit long-winded, random action platforming scenarios, the helpful 8-digit resurrection password system, and the opportunities to get the hang of every end boss pattern and level hazard avoidance approach throughout. Mindless rambling aside, they pretty much outweigh whatever stumbling blocks have established, and are amongst many catalysts to be routinely thrusting headlong into this spin-off time and again. Therefore, consider yourself non-goddamn compass mentis to even think about abandoning this obscurity. Henceforth, what's our final verdict on Ghosts and Goblins, Ghouls and Ghosts, and Gargoyles quests? There are absolutely no words to epitomize the massive, boundless magnitude of challenge each installment offers, as well as the long adventurous feel that the latter titles got going for itself. If you enjoy a well-balanced, albeit satanically infuriating, test of wits unlike anything the world's ever predicated and fathomed, do yourself a noble favor and hunt down those dreaded yet time-honored titles. Sure, they might extremely overwhelm you now and then, but at the same time, they never fail to enliven you to keep pressing the hell on non-stop. Likewise with what's in our honorable mentions altar. Before I go, I'd like to take this opportunity and thank MC Facepump for joining yours truly. <laughs> and until then, my faithful viewers, this is the Hardcore Retro God, officially signing off. <laughs>